parasites. During life, a person encounters them at least once. These can be commonplace fleas and pets or more unpleasant guests from the owner themselves. But God forbids anyone to meet with one of the representatives on our list today. These terrible and malicious creatures are capable of undermining health and even ruining the life of anyone who, through carelessness or due to a fatal set of circumstances, meets them on their way. Loa Loa or African Eye Worm The African Eye Worm is the causative agent of the dreaded disease Loa Loa filariasis. Skin rashes, itching, and fever are only the first symptoms of this progressive disease. This is caused by worms that travel under the skin of the eyelid and into the patient's blood. However, the course of the disease can remain asymptomatic for a while. It's until the helminth begins to cross the bridge of the nose or penetrate under the conjunctiva, thereby causing terrible pain. From the larvae that have entered the bite side by a special kind of carrier fly, Adult worms 2 to 7 cm long slowly develop. Dense, painful swelling of various parts of the body. And if the eyes are injured, swelling of the eyelids can occur. The formation of abscesses around the dead adult helminths is also clearly pronounced. All this is fraught with the fact that when the parasites move, nerve endings are irritated and the metabolic products of the parasite poison the human body and cause allergies. There can be only one prevention of infection, is to protect against the bites of horseflies, which are carriers of the disease. Guinea worm or Dracunculus medinensis Guinea worm is a parasitic roundworm that causes the disease of the same name in humans, guinea worm disease or, in other words, Dracunculiasis. Dracunculiasis is a crippling parasitic disease that is on the verge of elimination. People become infected by drinking water containing contaminated microcrustaceans. The larvae emerge from them, penetrate the human intestinal wall, and develop in the abdominal cavity, turning into adult worms in about one year. About a year after infection, an excruciatingly painful blister forms and, in 90% of cases, it is localized on the shin. Then, one or more worms are released outward, causing a burning sensation. To relieve the burning pain, patients often immerse the parasite-affected body part in water. At the same time, the worm releases thousands of larvae into the water. Prevention is nevertheless possible, and it's thanks to it that the disease is on the verge of elimination. Filarial worms Lymphatic filariasis is caused by infection with parasites belonging to the roundworm family Filariodia. It leads to abnormalities in the lymphatic system. Moreover, it can cause abnormal hypertrophy of certain body parts, causing pain and leading to severe disability and social stigmatization. Adult worms live in the lymphatic vessels and disrupt the normal functioning of the lymphatic system. Their lifespan is about 6 to 8 years, and during this time they produce millions of microfilari that circulate in the blood. Infection occurs as a result of the transmission of the parasites to humans through a mosquito bite. Lymphatic filariasis can be eliminated by stopping the spread of infection with annual courses of preventive chemotherapy. Ophiocordyceps unilateralis fungus However, humans are not the only ones who suffer from parasites on our planet. Many parasites skillfully manipulate host behavior to increase their chances of survival and reproduction. For example, some species of cordyceps fungi cause infected ants to leave the colony, climb up a plant and hang onto it, holding on with their jaws. After the insect dies, the fruiting body of the fungus sprouts from it. Essentially, Cordyceps turns the host into a vehicle to travel to a place that is perfect in terms of maturing and spreading spores. Scientists have demonstrated that the fungus attacks several important functions of the host's nervous system at once. For example, it knocks down the ant's daily routine by disrupting genes associated with circadian rhythms. Even more destructive, the parasite affects the victim's sense of smell, the main channel of its communication with congeners. As a result, the infected individual loses contact with the colony, moves far away from it, and does not return in time. An addition effect is the interference of cordyceps in the transmission of the neurotransmitters. 
As a result, the poor ant dies and the fungus continues its lineage. Moose Tick The winter or moose tick is a tick that mainly attacks moose. It differs from other ticks in its impressive size, up to 15 mm, which reaches its peak at the end of winter. In years when the infestation is significant, thousands of ticks can attack a single moose, causing problems for severely affected animals. The animal begins to overgroom itself to try to stop the severe itching. Some stop being afraid of people and may seem lost or confused. They may also stop eating and start going outside of their natural habitat. Weight loss and poor physical condition, fur loss and wounds and blood loss combined with harsh weather conditions can affect moose health. It makes them more vulnerable to predators, poaching and road accidents. In some cases, severely affected animals can die. Young moose are especially vulnerable. The winter tick can attack other species of ungulates, but it's the moose that suffers the most. It's not dangerous to humans. The highest number of winter ticks ever found on moose was about 100,000. However, this moose cub was already dead, most likely a victim of anemia, which develops when so many ticks deplete moose blood. Here is Leucochloridium paradoxum, another representative of flatworms. The final hosts of this parasite are birds. Eggs with bird droppings reach the external environment, where they are eaten by a snail. In its digestive tract, the parasite develops to the stage of sporocyst, which is an oblong sac filled with cercari. Such sporocysts migrate to the snail's tentacles, turning them into caterpillar-like shapes to attract birds by their bright coloration and pulsation. The leucochloridium causes the snail to move to more lit areas and become more visible. Eventually, the bird eats the snail and the parasite enters the final host. After a bird feasts on a part of the snail, the parasite is home again in the body of its main host. Then, a snail's severed tentacles grow back. However, a holy place is never empty. After a while, new sporocysts penetrate there. This is how the poor snail will have to suffer for the rest of its life. Glyptopantalus parasitic wasps Some species of parasitic wasps of the species Glyptopantalus, also called ichneumon wasps, lay their eggs in the bodies of other insects, such as caterpillars. The parasitic wasp injects about 80 eggs into a host at a time, along with a poly-DNA virus and a small amount of venom that paralyzes the caterpillar until the wasp makes a clutch. The virus helps suppress its host's immune system so that the host fully adjusts to the larval rearing function and does not turn into a pupa. The hatching larvae grow and develop inside the unfortunate victim, feeding on its lymph without damaging its internal organs. After that, they leave the caterpillar's body, attach themselves nearby to a leaf and pupate. But two or three larvae remain inside to control the caterpillar. Under this control, instead of continuing its development, it stays in place and selflessly protects alien larvae from other insects. When the Yonic Newman wasps emerge, they die. Cymothua exigua, or the tongue-eating louse. Here's a unique parasite that not only eats the body parts of its host, but completely replaces what it has eaten. The tongue-eating louse penetrates through the gills and establishes itself in the body of a fish, the spotted rose snapper. It eats the tongue of its victim and then begins to feed on the mucus and, however, it works diligently instead of the tongue. Female specimens reach a length of up to 3 centimeters males up to 1.5 cm. The lice multiply right in the mouth of the fish. Periodically, a sexually mature male swims into the fish's mouth through the gills and mates with the female living there. Another surprising thing is that while the tongue-eating louse is growing, it is a male. Once it penetrates the snapper's oral cavity, it transforms into a female. Sometimes, the tongue-eating louse can settle in the mouth of large fish in pairs. The victim uses them as its tongue, unaware of the replacement. Kandaroo or a vampire fish 
Both parents and officials always remind us that pissing in rivers or lakes or pools is not allowed. Now, for sure, no one will do that after reading about the kangaroo. It's a very little fish that lives in the Amazon and penetrates the bladder during urination. It feeds on blood and flesh in the body, causing severe pain. Indians consider this fish more dangerous than the piranha. When swimming in rivers, the fish can easily penetrate a person's genital urinary organs, resulting in terrible pain and ultimately death. The vampire fish is the only vertebrate that lives a parasitic life on humans. The gadfly is capable of laying eggs in the human body. If the gadfly has chosen someone as a victim, then the victim will nurture thousands of larvae, which will hatch from the eggs. For the larva to grow, it will eat everything it finds around it, which is flesh. As a result, a hole will form on the body and the person will feel the larva moving under the skin. Removing the parasite or eggs will require the help of a surgeon. Parasitizing in the body of cattle, the gadfly causes the development of a very dangerous disease hypodermatitis. The larvae of the subcutaneous gadfly have enough time to severely traumatize the organs and tissues, as well as the skin of the animal. During the period of tubercle formation, the productivity of animals is noticeably reduced, weight gain of young animals and meat quality are reduced. The gadfly larvae secrete a special toxic substance, hypodermatoxin. Together with the meat and milk of an infected animal, it can enter the human body, harming health. Conclusion: Humans and parasites have likely coexisted together since the beginning of life on Earth. Each of us fights for our own survival in our own way. Parasites have chosen the path of symbiosis and exist solely thanks to their host, be it human or animal, or even insect. Looking at the parasites mentioned today, we can only hope that in our lives we won't share our bodies with any of them.